Today, we're very happy to have Jill Sweetman, known as the Brain Whisperer from Sydney, Australia. She is a neuroscience communicator who works in learning and development. And along with Jill, we have Dr. Patrick Quaid. Dr. Quaid is an optometrist at the View Cubed Vision Therapy Clinics in Guelph and North York, Ontario. He's the author of Learning to See, Seeing to Learn, Vision, Learning, and Behavior in Children. Welcome, both of you. Thank you for Thank having you us. Thank you very much. Wonderful to be here. Patrick, based on your experience, what do you view as the number one barrier overall for children when it comes to thriving in school and thriving in life? Well, I, I think based on uh, the pediatric cases that we see in our clinic, um, about half of our patient base are children with IEPs, which stands for Individualized Educational Plan. And these are, these are children who are struggling in the classroom, primarily with reading, spelling, uh, and often with attention issues in the classroom as well. So what I really think is a really good topic to talk about here is, is the building of self-esteem in these kids, the building of um, their, their self-perception of their ability to succeed. And what we see a lot in our clinic is when the kids come to us initially for these assessments and they often see 2020 with both eyes, but their eye teaming is not quite the way it should be. A lot of these kids have what we call the failure syndrome where they will, you know, if you present them with a, with a visual task, they'll disengage very, very quickly and kind of have the, well, here's another thing I can't do. Um, so they disengage very, very quickly. And often that, that, that drop in self-esteem becomes like a snowball over time. So, so I think self-esteem is probably the biggest thing for us. And on the initial consult with the kid, and obviously the parents are in the exam room, on purpose, I actually put my foot on the pedal to elevate the chair up to eye level so that I can actually look the patient in the eye. Because I, I remember going through these types of issues as a kid. And, you know, the, you got this big, tall, towering doctor looking down on you. It's very intimidating when you're a child. So, so I always elevate the kid up and I say, hey, there's a wonderful new concept called talking to your patients. And you just see the patient just beam up and light up. So trying to engage the kid. And that also helps in case history, trying to find out exactly what's going on with them. Because a kid is not going to tell you what's going on unless they trust you. And I think that's really important in the exam room. So, so I think building self-esteem is probably the key area for me. Good, Joe, what are your thoughts on this big topic? Oh, golly, it is a big topic. And Patrick, I concur with everything that you've said. You know, uh, the notion that where you commented about looking at a child face to face is so true. Um, my background is as a teacher in the last 30 odd years, I've had my own business, but I've been tutoring, private tutoring for uh, well over a decade now. And what I do when I'm working with a child is I'm not looking for them to get the right answer. I'm tracking for how they are thinking. And when you can uh, acknowledge with a child and say that, you know, I, there's, the answer's not quite right, but you know, like the way you're thinking. And particularly with the, the online gamers that I work with, you know, these children have been sequestered away and they have not had interaction mm -hmm. very much at all. And to have someone actually look at them eye to eye, as you've said, Patrick, and acknowledge the worth of the child and the validation of them as, as a wonderful little individual and also the way they think. And I, I always look and say, always look for the second right answer, not just the so-called first right answer. And I love it when children naturally are creative and they, they just blossom when you can make a wrong answer right by allowing them to explain what, how they got to that answer. So for me, curiosity is, is really part and parcel of just being a gorgeous little spirit and in an adult as well, because all adults want to be acknowledged for, for who they are. But that sense of giving them the license to be curious and to ask questions and to be humble and to and be bold really in a way, um, Real, I think will determine a great deal of success in a lot of individuals, which of course taps in to what you were saying about self-esteem. And I think what's, what's really interesting in vision therapy is um, doing therapy on a, on a child in a, in, a, in a therapy setting or an optometric setting. There's, there's one golden rule that we have and it's, you know, you never, never rob the child of the answer. So you never give them the answer you let them come to the conclusion themselves and you can call it a Socratic method of learning or whatever you want to call it. But in vision therapy, that, that exact thing that you referred to Jill, which is great is making sure that it's the child that discovers the answer, 
but you have to set the level of therapy for it to be not too high that's frustrating, but not too low that the kid's getting bored. And that's, that's the challenge in vision therapy, but you're a hundred percent right that, that allowing the child to self-discover and come to that answer. And I think in both in therapy and likely in education, that, that Socratic method is, is really, really key. Well, I, I was doing some research around um, Dr. Marlies Witt from the University of Arizona, who talks about um, really showcasing ignorance. And I think ignorance is the word itself has been um, given a bit of a bad, bad rap, a bit like discipline, really. You know, <laughs> there'll be no discipline in this house, you know, for some reason, discipline's bad. But she talks about the fact that curiosity and ignorance and questioning are this wonderful triad. Uh, and, and that's what we really want to have with any individual. I mean, and, and us even learning today, you know, we're curious, we're questioning and we're acknowledging what we don't know. And mm -hmm. just the spirit of that brings forth a great insight. And that's what I want to do with the children that I'm working with and the adults that I'm working with as well. Mm -hmm. Joe, why don't you tell us a little about the work you do in education and neurocommunication, learning development, all the things that are part of your story as you help others. Grant, well, thank you. I'd love to. Um, I've always been in the field of education, um, having first of all been uh, a, a teacher and then uh, I left the teaching profession and I've been in my own business for 30 odd years and gone into the corporate world and I've been uh, privileged to be a guest lecturer. But I don't think I've ever I've ever left education as such because I think there is nothing more wonderful than seeing others acknowledge their potential and to to find their gifts. And I think that's where my focus has always been is to when I'm working with someone is to have them identify their true worth and where their passion lies. Because once you tap into that passion. Um, all of the other difficulties will take on a different light because then you have the opportunity to, to use that to their advantage. So whether I'm corporate coaching with executives inside organisations or whether I'm working with my university students or whether I'm working privately with, uh, with young people and their, their families, I, I really look to be the voice for those who do not yet have a voice. We can learn more about Jill and the work that she does on jillsweetman.com. Thank you, Joe. Pleasure. Thank you. Dr. Quaid, why don't you tell us a little bit about the work that you do in your clinics in Guelph and North York, Ontario, and of course, off uh, the work that you do as an author and an educator and researcher in your practices and beyond. Thanks, Grant. Be happy to. Um, well, we, we have a clinic in Guelph and North York, and I like to say that we, we empower people and unlock human potential. And, and, and the reason why I say that is we're doing it through the visual system and obviously through patients who have eye teaming issues and eye focusing issues. But part of that message is making sure that, we, that we're able to bring out the best in every patient that we see, that we make them aware of their own potential and where their strengths and weaknesses are. And obviously we will deal with the visual things, uh, but we try to bring in people uh, like, like Jill from, from other perspectives uh, when we require them. So, so being able to help that patient to, to realize where their difficulties are coming from, if it's from a visual standpoint, um, and we also are unique in a way that we are also a research clinic and we actually get a grant from the Canadian government as well, where we collect data as we're treating uh, the kids. So the, the real cool part is I kind of get to be an academic and a clinician at the same time. So, so I get to collect data, I get to publish it. We've published a paper in uh, Grace Clinical Archives of Ophthalmology in 2013, where we looked at IEPs versus controls and we looked at the difference in eye teaming skills between the two groups. So but what I realized over the years was I had many, many a parent turn around and say, yeah, it's great. You got a PhD. It's great. You publish all that stuff. Sounds great. But the public doesn't read research papers. You need to write a book. And, and I, I thought, oh, because I'm so used to writing in, in, in research journals um, that writing the book was a challenge for me because it's, it's more conversational as, as, as an academic, every sentence you state, you have to have two or three references afterwards. It's, it's really, really heavy lifting. Um, it, it was actually kind of, it was a liberating experience to write the book because I could write that, you know, from, from my heart to a parent to say, Hey, this is a conversation over a coffee. I wanted to come across in that tone. 
Um, and it gives good information in the book about, about how to navigate the world of if my child has an eye problem, because, you know, your child doesn't come with a user manual. You know, you have to figure out stuff by observing your child. Um, and I think trying to get that book out um, was also a an ode to my mother because she was the person who really pushed things from a vision therapy standpoint for me. And, and you know, for me, getting that book out was was kind of just getting the message out to other parents that hopefully somebody comes across it and reads it and some some good comes from the book. Great. We can learn more about Dr. Quaid through his book called Learning to See, Seeing to Learn, Vision, Learning and Behavior. It's available on Amazon, Audible and many other places. Thank you, Dr. Quaid. Thanks for having me. Well, this has been great. Thank you for a great conversation on this important topic and so many more things that we can talk about. We've been joined today by Jill Sweetman, the Brain Whisperer. Uh, you can visit her website, learn many more things, lots of good resources there for you to enjoy and to learn. And also Dr. Patrick Quay, who's the author of Learning to See, Seeing to Learn, Vision, Learning and Behavior in Children. Thank you both for making it an interesting conversation. Thanks for Bye. having us.